A warm welcome to this SICC webinar. Uh, today's webinar is an initiative of our legal services interest group. And you can see the topic on the screen, the business side of disputes, can mediation help? And we're going to find out all about mediation and the difference between it and litigation and the advantages and maybe some of the disadvantages uh, with the help of a terrifically energetic panel. And that panel uh, is led by Lei Ting as moderator. And I want to thank Lei Ting and her colleagues at Allen and Gledhill LLP for putting this together. They, they brought a terrific panel together to talk to you about the whole issue of mediation and how it can benefit you and your business, save you time, money, manage risk in a different way. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to Lei Ting and just briefly say before I go that if you need to ask any questions and we hope you will, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'll be back with you at the end of the webinar just to make some brief closing remarks. But for now, uh, Lei Ting, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm currently a disembodied voice. Yes, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to leave this slide up just as I introduce um, the people that we have on the panel today. Victor is absolutely right. We've got a very energetic panel. Um, they're all lawyers, but actually uh, we would take Stanley and Sandy Park uh, and, and Sing Chi from their perspective as um, people from the business side of things. So Stanley Park is Managing Director and Head of Legal of uh, Asia Pacific in Scotiabank, but he's not here to speak on behalf of Scotiabank. He's here to speak from his experience uh, and many, many years of experience uh, in the financial services industry uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, in, in business. Um, Sing Chi uh, is currently a Chief Corporate Officer of uh, JASCO, uh, but actually if you look at uh, Sing Chi's profile uh, in the uh, introduction to, to this uh, webinar, you will actually see that, you know, he comes from uh, having had experience in a whole variety of uh, different areas. And with me, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Stanley Lai, uh, my colleague, as well as my other colleague, Ms. Vivian Ang, so lovely uh, to have joined a firm with so many mediators. Uh, and Stanley is not just a senior counsel, he's also a senior mediator uh, with the Singapore Mediation Centre. Uh, and Vivian uh, is also a mediator and a specialist mediator in maritime uh, law. So I won't go too far into uh, the introduction to, to all these wonderful people, because if I went through their CVs, it'll just take up all the time. Um, and actually the whole purpose of having this uh, panel discussion is just so that we can actually all really talk about this concept of mediation, because I always find that, you know, when, when people sit around talking about mediation, most of the time it's mediators trying to tell each other how great mediation is. So I'm actually looking forward um, to a frank discussion about really when is mediation appropriate uh, for businesses, uh, when it might not be appropriate, and actually when it comes time, for example, to even picking a mediator, uh, what would you do? So the first question I throw out um, is to Stanley Park, and so happy to have Stanley join us uh, from serving out his stay home notice. Uh, hopefully we're keeping you company and making things a bit interesting for you, Stanley. Um, so, Stanley, as someone who's been in the financial services industry for a number of years, right, what do you think would be a typical approach of, um, you know, a business in this industry to managing a dispute? Yeah, thanks, I think. Um, I think it's, it's hard to say categorically you know, what, what uh, uh, our approach would be or what, what the approach of any finance institution or, or even particularly a bank would be in any given dispute because it really depends so much on the facts and circumstances. Uh, not only of the particular matter uh, involved, but also the parties. So it depends on you know, the situation of the bank or, or the counterparty, what kind of transaction is involved, how big the transaction is, how strong the facts are, your case or against you. Um, I, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that mediation is always appropriate. Um, I don't think that any bank would dive, uh, would consider seriously mediation. If, for example, and this is just one example, 
if they had uh, a very clear cut case in their favor and it was a very straightforward kind of simple sort of situation where a borrower simply owed money to the bank. Uh, I, I don't think mediation would be, would be in the cards unless there was some other kind of reason or special consideration that, that may be relevant. We would simply file a claim in the local court and expect to get our money back. So, so uh, I, uh, although mediation can be helpful in some situations, I think it requires uh, further, you know, kind of uh, further consideration about whether it's really appropriate. I think in many situations it wouldn't be. So along those lines, um, so it's a bit confusing here because we've got the Stanley Park and the Stanley Lie. So I'm just sticking with Stanley Park at this point. Along the lines of, of you saying that, you know, a bank typically wouldn't dive into mediation right away because uh, most of the time uh, you would find yourself uh, on the right side of the law, for example. Would you then say that there might be hesitation in engaging in mediation as a bank because for example, it might message that, you know, the bank maybe has some vulnerability. Would that be something that would hold the bank back? Maybe, maybe in some cases, I think. Um, I, I don't think that would be a, a, a material consideration in necessarily. Uh, I, I don't think we'd be afraid of, of, of appearing to be weak uh, because we're, you know, simply because we're willing to talk to the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if, if anything else, we would want to portray or project an image of reasonableness. And maybe in some situations, uh, it, it may be it may be reasonable to actually to talk to the other side. Um, uh, I think in 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 certain in certain situations where where uh, uh, where where the relationship with the other party is very important, mm -hmm. and we didn't necessarily want to go in and just kind of uh, take as much money or win as much as we could, but we mm -hmm. wanted to preserve the relationship mm -hmm. uh, for ongoing transactions or an ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. I, th I think mediation would be would be a very a very possible alternative, a very serious alternative. Also, in, in the case of employee disputes, in some cases it may make sense to to uh, to mediate, but uh, uh, but not not always, not always. But uh, yes, it's it's good to hear. You know, so I mean, as someone who does a lot of mediation training, and you know, and then having taught law students, for example, when we talk about you know, a relationship is important and so on. Uh, I think it's very important to hear about the importance of preservation of business relationships from someone like you, Stanley Park, because then people don't think that it's just a pipe dream. It's all just this optimist, all, you know, wanting to go around, spread the love, but actually it's real. It's a very real consideration in terms of preserving relationships. So let's move on to Stanley Lai. Um, so Stanley, um, you know, senior counsel, litigator, et cetera. So when people come to you, you know, surely they would come to you to fight for them and do the best for them and, you know, display your eloquence in court. So what are the circumstances when you would actually broach the subject of mediation to a client? Um, okay, first of all, I think, I think to, 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 to put the matter in some context, um, that there used to always be this bravado about, you know, whoever suggests mediation first, uh, that's a sign of weakness. Uh, the, the way to get around that uh, conundrum uh, is to look at the Supreme Court practice directions, which actually makes it mandatory for us as a matter of professional duty to advise clients on ADR options, including mediation. So, so, so that being the case, I prefer to look at mediation not so much as a, a, a question of timing, but as a question of process. So, when taking instructions, obviously you need to form an assessment and advise the clients on the strength and weaknesses of the case. And if the decision is made to go ahead, then prepare the papers. Um, and maybe after you do that and you're in a position to file the, the action in court, um, the client needs to be advised that at some stage um, after the first PTC, parties will be, will be asked the question, is this a suitable case for mediation? So the question actually is foisted on the parties. I mean, it's not, not you, you have some latitude before the action is filed and served uh, to raise the option. But my, my personal preference has always been to uh, make sure at least there is a dispute on the cards. It's very rare to actually have parties that uh, are quite prepared to go into a mediation before action actually takes place, unless uh, there is a contractual provision uh, for escalation and also for uh, pre-litigation mediation. So some contracts provide for that, in which case you can proceed with that first. Hmm. I think it's actually quite important to, as you say, uh, know what the dispute is. And I think even when it comes to 
uh, mediation provisions in contracts, I think it would actually be beholden on the parties to actually frame uh, the dispute. And that's why I suppose it would be helpful to actually have commence proceedings first so that you actually have a frame uh, for the mediation uh, to take place. Um, okay, so let's let's move on then to um, you know Saint Chi, right? So it's 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 very clear uh, that when um, you know business would actually engage external counsel as you used to be. Uh, so, but now you engage uh, external counsel. Um, when the approach has been made to external counsel, the business has already made the decision that there's going to be significant expenditure. Uh, on pursuing a specific outcome. I mean, they, they've decided that they're go just going to take action, right? So in a business like JustCo, which is all about innovation, right? Uh, solutions and being ahead of the game and, and uh, you know, uh, being so sort of innovative and, and all that, right? What is your chief priority in choosing a dispute resolution process? Thanks, Leiteng. I think that's a great question. Uh, thanks very much to SICC for having me on the panel, first of all. I think I'll offer some thoughts from the view of a late stage startup like Jusco. Uh, for us, everything that we do, the number one priority for us is speed. And that includes litigation and dispute resolution. The, the avenue that will get us to the outcome and the solution that we want as quickly as possible, the fastest way to do it, that is the choice that we will make. That is the avenue we will choose. So uh, in Singapore, uh, fortunately, uh, speed in litigation is not a big issue. I think court processes move uh, relatively quickly. Uh, courts outside of Singapore move more slowly and that could influence our decision whether to litigate or to mediate or to settle uh, out of court. Now, putting aside the, speed, the issue of speed, uh, for companies, as you mentioned, which are heavy in innovation and new products like us, I think a large part of what drives us is our belief that we are right. And this is the mindset that we, we start off with always, that we are right. We believe passionately in our product. We believe the market wants our new stuff. And we believe that we are here to prove a point. So I think these characteristics uh, very much define startup culture. Uh, without these traits, startups, you have no chance of surviving infancy, uh, let alone thriving. So in other words, we, we have an overwhelming desire and drive to win. So I think when you put that into the mix, it's not often that we choose mediation consciously because when we run up against a dispute, it's almost contrary to our DNA to settle because we are so convinced that we are right and we have a point to prove. Uh, it might be a handicap, it might be a blind spot for many startups. So I guess uh, sometimes it, it pays to have adults in the room to advise uh, everybody else to kind of step back and take a more balanced view of the whole situation. And also the way the pros and cons. Uh, of going into mediation versus taking litigation all the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And ultimately, when you bring the commercials into the mix and you are weighing the cost of engaging counsel, going through the process versus settling very quickly, and this is where the issue of speed comes back into play, uh, I think we do have cases where we find mediation to be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think, can I get just follow up with a question for saint on that? I, I, I thought your comments were very interesting. It, very good, but uh, I, I did have a couple of questions. That, um, you, you believe that you're right, but what if, what if you don't believe you're right? What if you're not sure? Yeah. But would they ever admit it, right? So. <laughs> because, because, I mean, I, I, I get you, I get you. I, especially, you, you feel you're right about your mission and what you're doing and the product, and, but there, there's so many disputes, at least, that I've come across that, that sometimes, yeah, sometimes we're right. And I mentioned the late thing that when we, when we were right or when the facts are clear, yeah, sure, we, we, don't, we don't consider mediation that, that, that much. So, but a lot of times we're not so sure, mm -hmm. and and so so uh, that's my, that's my first question. What do you do when you're not when you're not right? And second, is speed really is that really the most important consideration all the time? I mean, that's yeah, we, it's it, I, I I understand what you're saying, but um, the, the quickest way to, to to get rid of a dispute, at least in, in my experience, is to settle. It, it'd be perhaps the most costly, or there may be. You know, we might be setting a precedent for other people to file similar suits, or we may think we're, it's not fair. Or, but, but speed, although it's important, and it is important to us, it's not always the only or the determinative factor. So I, I was just wondering, <laughs> wondering uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to flesh that out a little bit, your comment that speed is always the most important factor. Um, you know, Maybe not if, so much the most important factor, but the first um, sort of priority that sort of comes to mind. But actually, it's a very good question that you've asked, Stanley. Um, 
what happens if you're not sure whether you're right, right? Uh, this is sometimes the case. You do. Right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and actually, related to that question is actually what happened when mediation first started in Singapore uh, in the 1990s, when I was very young. <laughs> uh, and uh, essentially, what some people were doing in mediation was they were using it as a fishing expedition because they didn't know. They didn't know information. They wanted to get information from the other side and they wanted to use it as a way of you know, um, weighing uh, uh, the, the pros and cons. So um, maybe Sanji, you think about it first, but, but let me sort of turn that question uh, that Stanley has asked to you, uh, Vivian, because, you know, and we, we are talking about, you know, uh, people in startups who think that, you know, they are always right and, you know, big egos and all that. And you are in the maritime uh, law industry and I'm very, very sure that you've got massive egos there, right? So have you ever, ever come across a situation where, you know, um, actually, if you are actually proposing mediation to a client and the client says, you mean you're not sure? You, you mean you think that the case is not very good, which is sort of along the lines of what, Sally Park seems to be suggesting. Vivian? Vivian, you're on mute. Right, so in, in litigation, not only shipping litigation, everyone starts off thinking that they are right. Okay, that's why the dispute starts. If you know you're wrong, you probably will settle right up front. But it gets along and the litigation gets protracted and expensive and costly because both sides are very convinced or their lawyers have convinced them that they have a good case and they have a good defense. So they want to prove their point. But no matter how strong you think your case is, going to court is always a bit of a lottery, if you ask me. I've been to court thinking that we have the strongest case ever and we have lost. I've been to court where we think we have a hopeless case and we have won on every point. I don't even know how we won, but you know. So it is a bit of a lottery. And if you win the first round, you go to the court of appeal, you can get reversed. So either way, there's a risk factor which the clients should be told about. And, but I agree with, with Seng Chi and, and the sentiments that you know you want to be right because in all the mediations that I've been involved in, it's always the lawyers, that's me, um, proposing mediation and the clients actually resisting it, right? They want to fight all the way. But if you look at the cost that you will save, you look at the time that you will save, and you look at the ability to resume your business quickly once you put aside all this um, disruption to your business, the stress involved and, and you know the time that you require of your employees, your staff to give evidence and to take statements, it's really very draining for the, for the parties. And um, uh, mediation is one way of, of speeding up the whole process. And winning a case is not always about winning in monetary terms. For me, winning, I always remember is very simply the three R's. You know, you repair the relationship, you restore the confidence, and you restore the business, resume your business and your trust. Because otherwise, things get very long drawn out. But I do agree that if you have a very difficult opponent on the other side who just refuses to see reason um, and you think you have in a very strong case, then sometimes mediation is not going to work. Mm. Um, and, and the parties have to come into the mediation willing and wanting to settle because if not, we had one where both parties ended up just yelling at each other, really shouting and, you know, gesticulating and one was in Zoom, one was in person and they were just screaming and banging the table as a result of which we were the claimants with a $300 million claim expecting to get money out of it. We ended up driving the parties even further apart because suddenly the defendant had a counterclaim for several hundred million. So, and the mediator couldn't do anything because that comes to the next point that we talk about the choice of mediator. He was not very effective in bringing the parties together. So we were actually pushed further apart. But mm. interestingly, at the end of the day, it did knock some sense into the parties, even though they shouted mm. at each other, it gave them the opportunity to vent. That is one good thing about mm. mediation. Mm. We shout, we, we just let go, and then parties come to their senses. So we did settle the case eventually mm. to everybody's relief. Um, 
<laughs> and it's always not in the lawyer's interest for settlement because it, you know, it means the end of our, all our legal costs all the time. <laughs> we churn up. So we are acting against our own interests. But I think the client's interest always comes first. Mm. So I'm a great hey, can, make one, can you make one comment about willingness to mediate? I think you made some very interesting comments here and about willingness to mediate. And it might reconcile your comments or perhaps my, some of my comments with the, the St. Chi's uh, kind of views. Um, I find, and I'd be interested in hearing what, 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 what the others say, I find that there seems to be somewhat of a correlation, at least uh, uh, among certain types of disputes uh, or disputants maybe, uh, between the size of a company and the willingness to mediate. Let, let, let me say why. I, I think, I think the, the willingness to mediate oftentimes, not always, not always, uh, is influenced by a desire to maintain the relationship or, or to not only, not necessarily the Repair the relationship as you come in, but to maintain it, yeah. and, and that 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 desire to maintain a relationship oftentimes uh, uh, depends on how many common interests the two disputants have. And the larger the company, the more likely there is going to be kind of other interests the companies have in preserving. Whereas if you're a small startup or you're a smaller sort of company, you tend to be a little bit less uh, broadly dispersed in your business activities, your business interests, and, and other kind of concerns. And you're more focused on your product or, or, or what your kind of uh, uh, what your company is, is doing. So you tend to be less open to some of the competing considerations that lead bigger companies to, to want to mediate or continue the relationship. So I see a, a, a somewhat of a correlation between the size of a disputant and uh, the willingness to mediate. Not, not, not always. I mean, there are all sorts of other factors, but that would be my, my point for consideration. I'm not sure actually, what the other thing Thanks for that, Stanley Park. And I actually want to turn that to Stanley Lai um, to, to actually address that point, because I think there is a perception that, um, you know, if, if you feel that um, as a party to a dispute, you are a very large company and, you know, you, you really can't be bothered with this sort of thing and you've got your lawyers on retainer anyway and whatever you're paying your lawyers, you know, they'll give you a, they'll slash it and give you a discount because, you know, they are beholden to you anyway and you don't really um, pay much attention to wanting to resolve that dispute. So there is a, a misconception there because I actually have uh, come across many cases where you've actually got pretty big um, organizations that are willing to engage in a mediation. Actually, for me, it's really about the people in the organization. It's the key person involved in that dispute or making the decision about how that dispute is to be managed uh, rather than sort of the entity itself. So um, Stanley Lai, what do you think? Well, absolutely, I completely agree. I mean, I, I never look at mediation as uh really a adjudication or, or, or pseudo settlement of rights. I look at interests and positions and a lot of that is articulated through um, the size of the company. Yes, may have a bearing, but their motivations, whether you're large or small, their motivations to settle. If you're a small size company, you want to be right and you want to press your case. Um, but the question then is at what, at what cost? At some stage, your, the cost spent in fighting the dispute may be actually disproportionate to what you seek to achieve from the litigation or any vindication of costs that you think you will get from uh, the other adverse party. So that, that's one motivation. For, for large companies, that's a question of, there's always the David and Goliath uh, factor. Um, you know, what, what happens if you are seen to be, you know, what, what, you know if you went for full-blown litigation, is it a David and Goliath uh, uh, speculation, or is that going to be a reputational hit? Is that going to be a social media pushback? So there are many different considerations that can dissuade companies, big or small, from pursuing litigation. And mm -hmm. that mediation may be an option, provided, and it's correct to say, the willingness has to be there. And you can tell in the first half an hour whether the parties actually are there to deal. If they're not, then it's better to call it a day. Or sometimes the lawyers may be the, the, the obstacle. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that also doesn't help. Yeah. yeah. So turning to St. Chi, not with your lawyer hat on because you've left that and you're now ordering lawyers around. You know, this, this point about large companies, small companies, startups with egos. And I just have this sense that, you know, you, and there's, there's this picture that I love, which I haven't been able to find again of a mouse. And then there's like an eagle swooping towards that mouse. And then the mouse is actually just flipping the bird at the eagle. So even if you're a small company, if you feel that you're right and you really want to get something out of that 
dispute, you might not want to go to mediation because you want to splash it all over social media and, and so on. So coming back to what um, Sally Park had said about is speed really the consideration and, and, and you know what happens if you're not sure. Coming back to an organization and a startup like, like Just Co represents, right? Who is the person that you would actually have to persuade to say, this one must be the eight love. Well, that, of course, that, that will be my CEO, right? I mean, <laughs> he's the founder of the company and uh, my job is to advise him uh, of all the considerations that he needs to uh, have in order to make the best decision for the company, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the points that we have discussed for the last five minutes re regarding the, the size of the company and how it influences decision-making and the role that speed plays in that decision-making, I think it's really, really uh, interesting because when I wrap all of these in the context of Just Co, this is the view that I want to offer to everyone, which is size of company absolutely determines the incentives whether to mediate or to litigate. I think uh, Stanley, Vivian, and, and Stanley, we have, we have all given the view that, okay, when you're bigger and you are, have more resources at play, there may be more at stake, therefore you might want to do uh, mediation or litigation, etc. But I'll offer another view, which is that big companies tend to have professional resources, which view decision-making as a part of the job, that is exactly, it stops there. It's just a job. But for a company like JustCo, mm -hmm. we don't see this as a job, right? We, we see this as more than a job. We see this as, as a cause. We see this as uh, something that has purpose. And we mm -hmm. see that we are trying to build something which is truly innovative and inspiring. Mm -hmm. So for us, when we make decisions, sometimes we get, that gets in the way and we often find that we have to step back and say, hey, guys, let's not cut off the nose to spike the face. Mm -hmm. Let's think carefully. But those considerations do come into play for smaller companies because ultimately you are fighting for your survival. And mm -hmm. it's not just a job. Mm -hmm. So that complicates decision making. And so I have to admit to that. Now, uh, as for speed, yes, it's, it's a top consideration for us, but by no means is it the only consideration because coming back to my point, you're not going to bang your head against the wall just because you want to pursue the fastest solution when you clearly know that that is not the right solution for the company, you're going to end up suffering a lot of losses. Mm. Actually, you know, what, what you're saying really brings to mind a lot of the mediations I've done where it, it, it really is about the personalities that are engaged in the mediation. So I want to ask this of, of Vivian Ang, right? In your, in your capacity as a litigator and then in your capacity as a mediator, right? You know, when you hear Stanley Park and, and Seng Chi talk about like the personalities and a, a big organization not necessarily having a personality because it's all about professional decision making and the bottom line. And then, you know, um, an organization like Justco where you've got actual key personalities that will drive everything, right? In your view, Vivian, who would you prefer to be the representative at the mediation? You know, so the first question would be, let's say you're advising, you know, um, a company in a shipping dispute, right? Like, would you actually, what considerations would you have in recommending the person who is the representative at that mediation? We start with that first. Mm, okay, so let, let me just backtrack a bit on the big company um, uh, view because we have clients who are very big and reputable companies and they refuse to mediate because they think that even if they may be wrong they want the court to adjudicate that they are wrong mm -hmm. because they find that the mediation even though I tell them it's confidential nobody will know the terms of the settlement they said it's like a sign of uh, conceding that we are wrong especially when the claim against them is for fraud and on no account are we going to be held liable for fraud. And if we mediate and we and people see that we are mediating, it's a bad sign. Yeah. Okay. So I said, but the court finds that you're fraudulent is even worse. They said it doesn't matter. <laughs> we can explain to the head or whatever CEO that it was a court decision. So, um, but in terms of who should attend, it, every mediation should be attended by somebody who has authority, of course. Mm -hmm. And the authority has to be an authority to settle. Mm -hmm. So the person himself must be willing to settle. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I told a thing about the joke where we had a mock mediation when the guy came in and said, yes, I have authority. I have authority to win. Uh, and <laughs> so they said, what? 
he said he's like, my authority is to win. And we keep saying there's no winning or losing in mediation. Right? So that kind of mindset is just going to make mediation impossible. So uh, you, you need to get the hot-headed people out of the room. Mm -hmm. um, we've had mediations where the opposing side made some very crude comments about our clients, bordering on, I would say, uh, um, it should be censorable, but it was so bad that it just destroyed the mood entirely. So you should not include such people at the mediation. Yeah, yeah. unless unless you're doing it deliberately, right? I mean, uh, uh, one thing to think about in terms of mediation when I am a litigator and wearing my litigator's hat is sometimes I think about it in terms of is this really something where I want a particular person to be able to vent because he or she is actually the block to settlement. And if I am confident that the mediator I pick is one who can actually manage this person, then maybe that might be the person that I want to put forward. Or it could be the person I really can't persuade because he will think that I don't think that he's got a great case. So I let the sort of mediator lean on him and give him the views and give him the perspective, right? Um, let's dial it back a bit because from, from some of the questions that, that we are seeing uh, in, in the Q&A, um, I think let's get a little bit into the fundamentals, right? So um, there's a question about what's the difference between arbitration and mediation and the key difference between mediation and out-of-court settlement. So, so let me sort of leave that to, to the lawyer first and, and, and ask that of Stanley Lai. Uh, before we come back to the point that, that I want us to pursue a little bit further with Stanley Park and Sing Chi, and this idea of the publicity of the dispute, you know, because Vivian was talking about, look, if the dispute is about fraud, then you settle it, then people have all sorts of questions. The PR of a dispute and how that is affected by mediation. But let's hold that off first and, and so, um, you know, go back and, and dial back a bit first. So Stanley, difference between arbitration and mediation and the difference between mediation and out-of-court settlement. Okay, uh, to your first question, arbitration is another form of dispute resolution uh, which takes place uh, based on institutional rules typically, uh, or, but it doesn't have to be, but it, it's, it's shrouded in, in confidentiality and it has to be typically pre-agreed. Uh, so incorporated by a contractual process. So if you choose, for example, for your dispute to be heard by, by, by arbitration using the in Singapore International Arbitration Center, then, then, then by the autonomy, the, the choice of the parties, that's where the, the dispute will, will end up being adjudicated and the courts will not uh, be involved in any way unless to provide curial assistance. Um, so it's a separate, it's a parallel uh, form of dispute resolution. Mediation, on the other hand, uh, is a, I like to think of it as a, an opportunity to settle that arises in the course of dispute resolution, whether it's litigation or arbitration. And peculiar to uh, certain in institutional uh, 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 arbitration centers like SIAC, you do have the upmet up procedure, which kicks you off with uh, an arbitration if you, if you start that. And then you, you can, there is actually a mediation process that's interposed um, before you. And if you don't achieve success, then you go back into arbitration. So, so you have these nuances uh, uh, being applied as well. So that's roughly the, the broad, you know, the a broad distinction between arbitration and mediation. As between mediation and, and out of court settlement, um, there are instances where lawyers can settle on behalf of their clients um, outside a mediation process. And, and one of the key questions a mediator would want to ask before you start is, well, have there been any discussions without prejudice discussions? So it does not see the light of day, but typically you want to see whether parties are engaged. And then that actually helps you manage the mediation because what you'd want to do is for the mediation to start from ground zero again, you may very well be able to build on some progress uh, that has been made and maybe a narrowing of, of this, the distance between different positions so you can opt for that. So that, that usually does happen. But mediation, of course, is the more formal setting where a mediator is appointed uh, or, or two mediators are appointed. Uh, and then they, they, you know, he or she or they um, mediate a dispute. And, and in the mediation, it's, it's, very, it's very rarely who's right, who's wrong. I always tell, tell disputants, it's not who's right, who's wrong, who's left. 
at the end of the day, which, and, and after a court process, with the vagaries and uncertainties that, that Vivian uh, very correctly alluded to, there's really no assurance. Yes. There's no assurance. So, you know, uh, thanks very much for that, Stanley Lai. And, and, and I think, you know, um, what we as mediators are always um, speaking of in terms of why mediation is um, something that people ought to consider is because we have gone through it we have actually seen parties come out of the mediation. We have had parties actually express to us, oh my God, what a relief. And I thought this was going to be a five-week trial or five-month trial, and we've settled it in a day. And, and, and they are relieved. And when I find myself telling this to other people who haven't come across mediation before, there's always that skepticism, right? Um, so I think it's, it's very good to hear from, from you guys because you are litigators who have actually dealt uh, with clients who do want to go to court, but who also go for mediation and are satisfied by mediation. But as Vivian says, not always. Um, so let's come back to... to like, the can I just, yes. Uh, yes, Vivian. A fundamental difference between uh, mediation and arbitration is that other, in arbitration, you get an award, which generally will be enforceable in many countries who are signatories to the New York Convention. So they say mediation is not similarly enforceable, so you can have an agreement. But in the up met up uh, scenario procedure, you can have your mediation recorded as an award. So you can actually enforce the mediation agreement if you transfer into an award. Yes. But what is so different is that all that is agreed on in arbitration is, you know, you agree on the institution, you agree on the rules, you agree on the procedure, but you don't agree on the outcome. So when the outcome comes, you're not happy. You know, one side will be very unhappy and one side wants to appeal and very little grounds for appeal nowadays under the, the International Arbitration Act. So you've got to live with it unless you can show fraud or, you know, miscarriage of justice and all that. But mediation is agreement all the way through, right to the time you sign. So everybody is happy and there will be no more appeals and unhappiness. So it's final. So that's the beauty of mediation. Yeah. I think can I give you can I give you my two cents on that, that question as well? Uh, sure. uh, it, which is it, uh, from my perspective, the difference, the fundamental difference between arbitration mediation mediation, and this is where mediation is not is not required or, or obligated. This is where parties want to mediate. Is, is, is attitude. So so if I'm going into arbitration, same thing with court. I'm going with an adversarial attitude. If I'm going into mediation, this is again this is not, when it's not required. I'm going in with, 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 with a cooperative attitude. I want to go I'll in and try say. to find. No, no well, I, I'm, well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean rarity, ideally, rarity, ideally yeah. or I mean, I'm going to mediation to find a solution that both parties are happy with. And this is where it's not like arb med arb or where you require contractually to mediate before you litigate or arbitrate or whatever. This is where both parties want to mediate. Okay. So, so at least for me, and, and conceptually, maybe ideally, could be somewhat stylistic. Um, you know, arbitration is adversarial. Mediation, at least when I'm approaching mediation voluntarily with another party that wants to mediate, I'm going yeah. in with with a, a, a fundamental or a, a different, at least a different yeah. attitude towards yeah. our interaction. So, uh, so Stanley, you, you're absolutely right that in order to go into a mediation and and have a go at it in a good way, you need to have a good mindset, and you shouldn't go into it with an adversarial mindset. But I can tell you that in, in the way that mediation has actually been pushed in Singapore, uh, it's been pushed. So people actually often um, are strongly encouraged to engage in mediation when they don't actually have that sense of I'm coming in to try and settle. So I'm sure, you know, those of us who've been in mediations here, we've actually started off mediations where people are not looking at each other in the eye. And, you know, the, the, the sense of tension in the room or on the Zoom is palpable, but I can also tell you, Stanley, that um, there have been many mediations that all of us have come across where the tone at the start and the tone towards the middle, usually after lunch, um, is very different. And they actually turn towards each other, this is for real, and they actually start engaging together and, and they can be turned. So I like that um, uh, response from you, Stanley Park, because I want you to consider the possibility that if, for example, uh, within your institution, um, there's someone who's very resistant towards it, uh, but if this is the person who's the key decision maker, right, and you tell this person, just give me a day, give me a day of your time, sit down with these people and see what we get out of it, 
right? I'm making no promises, but just give me a day and let's see what you can do. As a mediator, that's all I ask for because then I give it a shot, you know? Yeah, um, Sing Chi, do you have any thoughts about what, what we just said? Yeah, I think I agree with Stanley. It's a, it's a question of attitude mm. uh, because by design, litigation is an adversarial process. Starting mm. from pleadings to uh, interrogatories to uh, trial, etc. It's just each side telling the other side's story. I think mediation to some people, uh, it's a mental leap requiring them to see it from the other party's point of view. Mm. Uh, so if, if I think back to my litigation days from many decades ago, uh, I think I saw that really as an inconvenience because you're just pushing your client's point of view, right? You already prepared uh, the pleadings. You've done so much work. You are ready to go. And then yeah. land. Yeah, I have to go into mediation. Why? Because the practice rules says I must. So yeah. I, I saw it as, a, as an inconvenience, but that was just immature me because now I'm a lot more open and receptive to having alternative ways of solving disputes. But what, what changed it though, Sengchi, right? What gave you the conviction that other alternatives ought to be pursued, right? Because I mean, between Stanley Lai, Vivian Ang and myself, I mean, they are much more experienced litigators than me, but we have seen both sides. We've seen the litigation, we've seen the fights, we've seen the winning and the losing. Right, but we've also seen the mediation, right? And and so we we believe in both, and we sort of try and do both. But on your part, being on the business side of things, right? I think you and Stanley Pastor have that same view, and I'm, that's actually the whole point of this talk, which I I wanted uh, everyone to really think about, right? Do you always think for yourself first that no, I think this one cannot be mediated, so let's not even try, right? Uh, because I don't think that people would go into the mediation with the, with the right mindset. Whereas what I'm saying is, you know, okay, your mindset might not be great, but if you give it a shot, you know, maybe, maybe, is it possible? Right? Um, I, okay, Stanley Lai is nodding. <laughs> what do you think? No, I, I think, I think the, the, the key point to a mediation is, is to really, um, you know, even with emotions that I expressed, I, I have found you know, I mean, I mean, Vivian was recounting instances where people shout and all that. But if I was representing a party on the other side, the way I would frame it is, well, at least we know what we're getting from this witness in court. Um, I, I'm also making notes. So, so, so if I was uh, advising a, a party, I would also be looking at it from the, st the standpoint that, look, if this falls through, we're still better off because I have a better measure of who's on the other side. Which, which, is, which is very invaluable yeah. uh, and not always articulated, but we know it's there. I mean, this is over and above documents and anything else. It's just to get a yes. sense of the people involved. And I think me mediation brings the people together. Mm -hmm. and, and whether it results in an outcome or it doesn't, I think it's helpful. Yeah. And if, if a mediator can get the parties to click, then you'd be surprised at the range of options. But I've also had situations where I've gotten the parties to click, but at the end of the day, what, what you define as success is, look, I may not have settled A to, you know, A to E of the dispute, but I could actually settle A to C. So you go to court to fight D and E, which is fine. Yes. Which to me actually is, is actually a, a pretty successful outcome as well. So, mm. so I think, I think, I think businesses orientating themselves to different options, mm -hmm. I think that that's always helpful. You know. Yeah, so you've touched on a couple of things. One is options and actually the creativity that can come out of a mediation. And, and we can explore that a little bit further. But, but the other point is actually, you know, something that we, we sort of want businesses to think about as well, right? So yeah, okay, ever someone might say, yeah, 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 right? Um, there are 10 issues to deal with and, you know, uh, the, the pleadings are very long or it's going to be a very long uh, uh, case. But if we actually try the mediation and try for a day or two and actually work it out, you could narrow down the issues, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, maybe your key people don't have to be witnesses anymore because it's such a small point and you really focus on the main points, right? Um, and, and how about the idea of option generation and creativity yeah. uh, in a mediation, right? Um, Vivian, do you have stories to tell about um, creative solutions in a, in a mediation? Uh, put you on the spot there. So while you're thinking, I actually want to highlight what uh, Vivian talked about and, and Sammy Lai talked about in terms of the art meet up, meet up uh, approach. Because what's very good about that is when you start off as an arbitration, 
um, which is actually a very recognized form of dispute resolution, lots of contracts with arbitration clauses. But if in the course of arbitration, you sort of decide, okay, no, let's stop it here, take a pause, let's turn it into a mediation and see if we can settle it. And there are cases in the SIAC and SIMC working together where they've actually come up with a resolution and a settlement, which is then recorded as an arbitral award, which then can actually be enforced under the New York Convention. So what the Singapore Convention on Mediated Agreements tries to do is to replicate that. One of the questions was, you know, has that had any impact uh, from a business perspective? Um, but I have to say, currently, no, because even though we have 46 signatories, they're just signatories, they haven't actually ratified yet. And of the countries that have ratified, we've got Singapore and, you know, um, other countries which are not necessarily uh, huge countries that people actually invest in. So we're still hoping that the ratification, sorry, the sign signatories actually affect their ratifications. But I'm very sure that that in many ways, it's actually delayed uh, by the COVID situation. Um, so, Vivian, creative solutions, um, Stanley, or maybe in uh, St. Chi and Stanley Park's experience, have you ever come across creative solutions? Yeah, there should be many cases of creative solutions, but what I found in the cases I did was very interesting in that when the party is vented, then we realize what is the reason for them fighting, right? So in one case, client refused to pay any damages for taking out Anton Pillar order and we raided the defendant's office and we caused total havoc and mayhem and disruption. And they were asking for $3 million in damages. And of course, our clients were offering them zero. So there was a big gap. But when we heard the story from the other side as to why they felt entitled to $3 million, which of course was totally exaggerated. Uh, and then feelings changed because the party who was most affected was actually suffering from cancer. Um, he was very ill. His son was very ill. And we went to the office and we took over all his computers and everything and, you know, raided it. So we could understand the pain that they were going through. And so that caused our clients to relent a little bit and offer something. So that is one example where, where we understand where the other side is coming from. Because all we see is, you know, our clients tell us, oh, they're crooks, you know, they are all fraudsters and they're terrible people. But once we hear from the other side, we realize that actually they're not so terrible. And then we turn to our clients and say, yeah, guys, you know, they are not so bad as you portray them to be. So let's try and sort something out. So that's one oh, way. Yeah, I think that that actually just highlights the best part of mediation. When you have the right representative at the mediation and the mediation is managed in such a way that the issues come out, which may not be the issues that are uh, in the legal proceedings because there's so many other layers to right. a dispute, right? Um, it opens up the dispute so that, you know, as Stanley Lai says, you know, it, it, it's about your definition of success. If your definition of success is an agreement at the end of the day, then okay, maybe it's not so successful. But actually, in answer to one of the questions is, um, what is the percentage of... Uh, uh, cases that are actually mediated. We don't really know, but we do know that of the cases that are mediated at Singapore Mediation Center, uh, the percentage of success is over 75%, if not 80, I forget what the latest number is. Mm -hmm. And that's astounding if you think about it, right? Because these are disputes that come uh, for mediation and most of them are settled in a day. And you're talking about 25 to 80% settlement rates, right? So, so that is because you actually have the opening up of all the different issues. But then my question is, you know, Stanley Park, right? In a big faceless bank, <laughs> you know, what would you care if the other side sort of showed up and said, oh, I had cancer. And then, you know, if, if you're the representative, are you gonna call up the person who makes the decision and says, um, you know, can we reduce it because, you know, they had cancer. Does that really work for financial services industry? And maybe I give you an example about banks. So we acted for a bank who was involved in all this trade financing. So they financed all these cargoes which were put on all these ships. And there was a big scam because the Indian buyer just went bust and our clients were left holding all the bills of lading, which is ha commonly happening these days. So we advise our clients that you have a very strong position because you hold the original bills of lading. So you have title to the cargo, which has now disappeared. Now, this is a gray area in law. It's still... You know, two, part, two sides are arguing that the bank 
doesn't have the right to the cargo because they knew the cargo was going to be delivered without the bills of lading. But we very strongly advise the clients, you are absolutely right in holding and making the claim because you're the lawful holder. So we had like 16 lawsuits against 16 different ship owners. And those came forward to settle with us very quickly, just knew that the legal position was such. And they said, okay, we're going to offer you not 100%, 70, 80%, minimal costs, boom, settle. Those who refused to settle, we pushed, we got judgment, we got summary judgment. They end up paying the full claim, full cost. So, so the bank was right in a sense on holding out for those who refused to settle. But um, for those that did, did settle, yes, they got maybe less a percentage, but they saved a lot of time and they saved a lot of costs. So mm. it's a balance in the end. Yeah. And that's what we mean by win, right? I mean, so so I hate the word win-win because people are throwing it around all the time. It doesn't really mean anything. But what you've actually just described is precisely that everyone looks at what their resources are, what their capabilities are, and they settle with what they are satisfied with. And in a mediation, when you have that weight against the uncertainties of litigation, the certain cost of litigation, that satisfaction is what we mean when we say it's win-win, right? Can, can I comment on that? I think I, uh, I just want to. I, I agree with that to some extent, but I, I think that equally important, if not more important, is is not what you have now or what you walk away with from the mediation uh, forum. It's what you it's what you have going forward. And this would be my my suggestion, or, or my uh, this would be a, a consideration for for all mediators. And, and this uh, that is that is I I think that. The key, notwithstanding what I said earlier about attitude, and I agree totally, Sinji, about you know, what you said about attitude, and notwithstanding everything that was said about creative solutions and other layers, they all tap into what I think is the fundamental key to a successful res, uh, uh, mediation outcome, at least from what I've seen and, and from what I know. And that is an assessment and agreement of the underlying mutual interests of value going forward. So if you're a good mediator, and this is what I will look for when I, when I engage a mediator, and this is, what, this is what I hope a good mediator will do, this is what I think a mediator has to do in order to reach a mediation, uh, a successful mediation outcome. They have to find and hone in on and get the parties to really think about and prioritize the mutual interests of value in going forward. And that's where your creative solutions come in, standing like put in, or your different layers of interest, as Vivian said, or your attitude that Seng Chi said. All that hinges on both of the parties kind of realizing, hey, we have a lot of mutual interest in going forward together and putting aside whatever disputes we had in the past. And you can then you can craft a viable kind of mediated kind of agreement because both parties have an interest in maintaining that relationship. And that's why I said earlier, maybe I misspoke. That's why I said that I would think bigger, bigger companies tend to, to, to want to mediate more because at least sophisticated ones realize that there are more possible areas of overlap yeah. of mutual yeah. common interest in going forward. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I, think, I think that's the fundamental key. And I would hope that any media really, at least in most mediated situations where both parties are voluntarily coming to the table, uh, um, that that would be that would be really uh, the, the fundamental key to, to success. Yeah. Um, if if I could ask Ting Chi this question um, first, while I sort of uh, 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 give a bit of feedback to that, CJ, can you just imagine a situation where you would never actually advise mediation, right? Because I want to see whether that fits within what Stanley Park just said about the mediation mentality and a mediation that works, right? Um, um, and while you're thinking about that, I just want to come back to what Stanley Park has just said as well, that, that, that you know, a mediation is really about a situation where you really explore mutual interest, but actually there can be mediated settlements where the interests don't meet, but um, the constraints are similar, right? So there can be situations where both sides realize how much money and time and effort they're wasting on uh, the uncertainty of an outcome, uh, either in arbitration or in court. And the solution that you craft may not actually be the kind of solution where they're both hugging each other and loving each other and continuing their relationship. But they actually realize from a very commercial perspective that, yeah, you know, I actually think this is better than anything else that I can get. 
right? So just want to sort of um, lay that out for you. And I'm very sure that Stanley Lai and Vivian would have something to say about that. But coming back to Sing Chi, like, you know, in, in all the different places that you've worked, including IMF and all that, right? Would that be a situation where you just think, no, I don't, I wouldn't even try mediation for this one? That, that's an extremely complicated question. In the 45 seconds you gave me to think about it. <laughs> I try to break it down into two pieces, right? Uh, I'll, and I'll use this uh, analytical framework. Uh, logic versus emotions, okay? So if you play on logic, I can tell you that most cases will be amenable to mediation because you just have to analyze what is in the, the ultimate equation, right? As, as Stanley pointed out, what is in your common interest in order to arrive at a mediated outcome? But when emotions come in, logic goes out the door. So if I look back in my experience, the cases where mediation is very, very difficult to work will be family law cases, divorces. You can almost guarantee that mediation will never work because it's a zero sum game. Something for the other party means less for me. Uh, I think that, I mean, I might be generalizing and maybe a bit harsh, but my own experience having worked on family law cases is as such. And I think this raises a very good point too, uh, to the other points that Stanley and Stanley and Vivian have raised, we don't see mediation as requiring preparation uh, because it's almost as an adjunct to litigation. You're taking all these resources and you're investing them in having a litigated outcome. You're investing in your lawyers. But I wish more people would see mediation as requiring investment. They should see it as doing an M&A deal where you're doing your due diligence, you're orchestrating the meetings, you are scripting everything, right? What you say, at what point do you do this? What drinks do you serve? Um, you know, how do you prepare ahead of the meeting the night before? Uh, who do you bring into the room? Is this empower, person empowered to make a decision? When do you take a break to go outside to cool off and call someone to have another uh, go at the round of discussions? I think people need to do that if they really want to be successful, especially in high stakes mediations. They need to invest resources to prepare. Sengchi, you are absolutely right. And that is something that um, has been recognized um, in that, um, you know, there are these courses on mediation advocacy, which I think is the wrong term, but it's all about preparation for mediation. I want to add to what you're saying by saying this, this is really about using mediation as a strategic tool. So speaking to business people out there, right? You don't go into mediation thinking about compromise. You go into mediation thinking like the best negotiator you can be, Tommy Cole or whatever. You think about the outcome that you want, not the outcome that you can get in court. No, it's the outcome you really, really want. And then you analyze whether this is something that you can actually strategically get in the mediation. And in strategically getting it in the, in the mediation, it's all about the things that Sengchi has just said, right? You prepare, who goes, uh, what do they say, who says what at which point in time, who your mediator is, whether you try and um, uncut the mediator, sorry, that is a term for sort of brown nosing the mediator, you know? Or you wanna give the mediator a certain perspective of your client, cry, don't cry, right? Tissue, no tissue, whatever, right? So it's all very strategic because Mediation is actually your best deal-making opportunity, right? Um, and and yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Sing Chi. That was that was great because it's it's absolutely right. Mediation is something that is worth investing in, and the payout from that investment, I would say, is actually higher than investigation because it's in your control, right? And it's always evolving, right? Um, yeah, so maybe I can throw that to Sally, Lai, and Vivian, right? What are the kinds of things that you would do when you're preparing a client for mediation, for example? I, I try to put myself uh, in the mind, the mind share of the mediator. Um, I try and see whether there is a way to broach a settlement that will serve the client's interest. But at the same time, I'm also acutely aware, which was the point saying she made about there are certain types of subject matter that are very difficult to mediate. An example is a pattern. A pattern, if, if a pattern's validity is called to question in litigation, it's either valid or it's invalid. It, it's very difficult to, to, to basically partition a pattern into claims because especially if the inventor for, of the pattern is sitting in the room as well, he's not going to take kindly to the fact that parties will, will agree to a, a partial invalidation. It's not going to happen. So one way is to take the, the whole pattern challenge out of it, 
and then focus perhaps on, on cross-licensing and whether you can come to some sort of mutually beneficial arrangement with an exchange of technology. And that may very well be the outcome that gives, uh, you know, what, what Stanley says, uh, defines as the assured uh, uh, promise of value going forward, you know. So that's, that's one example. But I think, I think if you're preparing your clients uh, for the mediation, prepare them. Don't prepare them for, you know, what, what I said earlier about keeping, making mental notes of yourself, for yourself on, on taking, you know, taking a measure of your, your opponent, taking a measure of the, you know, the, the potential witness for the other side, what they're like. A lot of that's really up to counsel to basically keep to ourselves and yes. an appropriate juncture. Because if you share that with the client, it's not going, it's not going to help the mediation. It's probably say, so, yeah, well, we better, better start, you know, better start litigation preparation now. And, you know, yeah, we'll drop the AIC as before. But I, I would counsel. say, Stanley, you know, it varies. Some clients actually need to see how the other side comes across. So some clients, um, I, I've seen this in mediations with uh, retired judges. So I'm co-mediating with a retired judge, right? And then in a private session, right? Sometimes I might actually tell the client, did you see how this person came across to my co-mediator? And I'll say, co-mediator, did you like what he said? And I'm talking about the other side, huh? okay? So it can vary. Sometimes there are situations where you kind of want to make use of that as a rehearsal for them to actually reality test how confident they are about the outcome. Yeah. Vivian, um, either two choices, either preparing someone, uh, a client for mediation or what um, Stanley Park has said about, you know, it's about meeting interests. Are there situations where it's not about meeting interests, it's about the commonality in coming to a resolution? You can pick either one that you want to answer. Yeah, I pick both. Uh, <laughs> very quick. So, so on Stanley Park point, you know, we've had so many cases where I told the clients there's a continuing business relationship to worry about. And they tell me in my face, there's no way we want to continue business with these guys. Okay, finish, end of story. We settle this, we fight this, that's it. They are nobody to us and there's no continuing business relationship. So that argument fails. So, but then of course we have to talk about other things. In terms of preparing the, the clients, I think we need to, to prepare them uh, not only to know their case very well, to know the weaknesses of their case so that they, they you know, are prepared when the other side starts hitting them. But one thing I try to tell my clients is to watch the body language, okay? And to watch the other side's body language. So when they, when the mediator says something good or bad, they should be poker face because when we watch the body language of the other side, we realize that actually they were lying to us all along, right? Because when we we mentioned the figure, which we thought was very high, their eyes just lit up. It was so happy. Then we realized, bingo, that's the amount that they're prepared to settle it. So although their lawyers tried to harm and horse, no, no, 600,000 or 6 million is too high. We knew at once from the client's reaction, that was it. <laughs> they were ready to settle at that point. So I would tell my clients, watch your body language and watch yeah. the other body language. Actually, I just want to interrupt you there and say that one of the first mediations I did as a litigator, I actually over-prepared my client and I didn't tell her to sort of keep a poker face. So because I over-prepared her, when the other side made an offer within 10 minutes, she went, oh, okay. And then she's like, what the? I'm like, no, you know, because if she had just kept quiet, I could have given her more. But then she said, no, no, I'm happy already. Like, mm, okay, fine. So you're absolutely right. Good preparation means they know what they're, I mean, in, in Harvard negotiation terms is their badna, right? You know what your badna is, but you also know what you really want is, and then you get it, you're like, ooh, ooh right? Um, but yeah, it, that can happen in a mediation. You better tell them what the badna is as well. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's true. That's the worst Last alternative. alternative. Yeah, so that is the best outcome. alternative to negotiation, which is kind of what uh, you would use as your bottom line, right? So if in a mediation you get something better than that, then say yes, lah, right? But in a mediation also, you want to think about what is the worst thing because your bottom line could be based on all sorts of, you know, things that are not within your control, like whether the judge likes your arguments and so on, right? Uh, so then you've got to think about your worst alternative because that might well be the thing that actually eventuates. Yeah, Vivian, you had another question to answer, oh. which is that when when the when the when the interests don't really meet, can you still uh, arrive at a settlement? Most definitely. Um, for me, I always will never give up a chance to mediate. I'm very happy when the other side refuses to mediate because it shows that they are being very stubborn and that we have 
come in offering to settle and when they lose, you know, we can rub it in their face that they have refused. Um, but when they don't have any common interests, no future business relationship, it's still a matter of time, cost, speed, because it really is, especially if your client is a big client, calling on all their employees and staff to dig up all their documents and their records and to sit us hours on end preparing for witnesses statements and all that is it's a real pain mm -hmm. and they can cut through all that with a one-day mediation it's mm -hmm. it's really a big advantage so there are so many reasons to mediate besides just you know apart from finding the common interest which of course helps if there is one yes yes so uh i want to uh, before I sort of go into two questions that Sing Ching had raised um, very well uh, and very good questions when we were preparing for this, I just want to go back to what Sing Ching said about how in your mind, actually family matters and family disputes and divorces are the ones that are most difficult to mediate. Mm, they are the ones that are actually the richest for mediation, right? Um, and, and I mean, of course, you haven't been in practice all this time, but you know, um, family justice courts really push mediation and in my personal experience, really, it is one thing that has helped a lot of uh, marriage breakdowns in terms of making that breakdown just a little bit more manageable. So um, I think many of us would have mediated, you know, high net worth uh, um, uh, divorces, uh, divorces involving children and so on. So I like what you had said about, you know, looking at it in terms of logic and in terms of, you know, uh, feelings and, and passion, right? Um, I actually find that in arbitration and in litigation, it's all logic. And then it's actually somebody else's logic because it's the law and it's the court's interpretation of the law based on what everyone has said. And the passion side doesn't happen. But a good mediator would actually be able to manage both and make use of both um, to the best possible way in order to achieve a resolution which the parties themselves are happy with, right? So one of the questions that um, Sengchi had, had actually raised is about embedding mediation clauses. Sengchi, do you wanna do you wanna ask that question and maybe we can get Stanley Lai and and, and Vivian uh, maybe answer that question? Actually, Stanley Park would have been a great person to answer, but he's just sort of gone off. <laughs> yeah, Sengchi. Yeah, I, I was just curious. I, I, we know that these clauses are sometimes inserted into contracts that as a prelude to litigation, you have to go into mediation. Uh, what's your experience? Are clients generally uh, receptive to having these? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things which, um, which we would, you know, I mean, it's how you interpret the clause, obviously. So, so in, the, in a general case, you will have uh, an agreement to a pre-dispute pre mediation process. So that actually allows you to really talk to the clients and get them out of the mindset where they want to be adversarial and pursue a, a certain fixed line of attack into saying that, look, um, I think to owe this process, because if you don't, if you don't treat this, this process with the respect the clause imposes, that can also bear upon how you're perceived later on in the litigation. Uh, because because the, the contract is for all to see, the judge may very well ask the question, well, why didn't you pursue this outcome when you had the chance to? Did you do this? And, you know, at the end of the day, litigation is, is I always tell clients, is 70 to 80% based on, on the law, but 20%, you know, turns on whether the judge likes you. Um, that has a great bearing, and and if your, your final quality is so true, uh, sometimes that 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 negates the, the the possibility of success. So, so that process uh, is a useful means to to engage, but again, a lot turns on the lawyers, because if you have a lawyer for the other party, sometimes the parties are very keen to to mediate, uh, but it's actually the lawyers that are standing in the way, and you can tell as a mediator, you can definitely tell who's jamming the the, the Potential settlement up, yeah. Uh, and and sometimes I've resorted to to getting the lawyers to leave and just talking to the clients. Yes. Uh, and I've actually I've I've achieved a lot more doing that than you know. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I don't need you to be helpful. Yeah. 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 So, how, how do you tell Stanley? I mean, what are, what are some of the most telltale? You just go to keep doing it. You just got to keep keep doing mediations, and then you after a while you get a you're witness to a whole range of you know human behavior. 
Oh, uh, so there are the very obvious ones where they would always come up with something that just sort of jams things up, even though the flow is going well. Mm, there would be the ones who actually are very quiet, very insidious, but then you hear from the client things that you wouldn't expect the client to say because they're clearly actually planted by the lawyer, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, no, you can tell. And um, it actually becomes the most obvious when you actually have them in private session because then they will start naysaying and all that. And, and you would also know when you've left them, right? Uh, counsel and client, and then you come back and then client sort of looks very worried and things have moved back, right? Because the lawyer is really the one holding it back, right? Um, I had a delight once in uh, co-mediating with a retired judge who basically in front of everybody just said, can you stop your story, right? And I was like, Right, and then he really did keep quiet because he really was just interjecting completely useless and unhelpful things throughout the mediation. Not something I could say, something that particular retired judge could say, but yeah, we, we, we do see those. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got like um, 13 minutes left to go. Um, so can we actually do a, a quick round because I think uh, Sandy Park has sort of referred to this already, but let's say this to hopefully the to audience members who are mediators, right? If you are picking a mediator, uh, what would you look for? So uh, Sally Pao, you've, you've given us some ideas of it already, but let's let's look at it from the perspective of, you know, litigators, uh, Stanley Lai and, and Vivian Hang, and, and from the perspective of uh, a client, Sing Chi. Um, what would you look for when you're actually picking a mediator? So let's start with Sing Chi, go on to Stanley Park, then Vivian Hang and then Stanley Lai. Sure. Uh, when I look at this uh, issue, I put on my HR hat. So uh, I'm, I'm looking for a candidate. And uh, for me, the candidate should be someone ideally with number one domain expertise. So industry knowledge is important because uh, that knowledge gives all the parties confidence that this mediator understands the business or understands the issues that uh, are being handled, especially for very technical matters. Uh, then the second uh, two, the, the, the second one I'm looking for will be maturity and temperament. There has to be a willingness to listen, very patient. Uh, some warmth wouldn't hurt. I think a strategic firmness as necessary. That means you don't interject all the time, right? But when you, know, you feel that things are getting out of hand, you should be able to step in and say, stop, let the other party speak or uh, whatever. And the third one, of course, uh, which is very standard, will be track record. Uh, are there references from happy customers who have been helped by this mediator in the past? So domain expertise, maturity and temperament, track record. That those are my criteria. Great. Stanley Park? Yes, I, I, I mean, it would depend on, uh, it would depend on the type of, type of dispute. Now, obviously, what, you know, some of the remarks I made don't, don't apply to everything. And I think the rest of the panelists and you yourself, I think, kind of pointed it out uh, 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 quite well. You know, there may be situations where that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, the common interests aren't so relevant, but but I think I think in general I would want I would want my my mediator to be uh, 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 very observant uh, and and, and um, I guess very uh, um, uh, very wise uh, whatever that means. Uh, Does that mean they have to be old? <laughs> Not, not necessarily, but I, I guess it kind of, it, that, that concept of wise for me, at least incorporates a couple of the criteria that saying Chi has already mentioned, that's probably domain expertise, but not necessarily, he doesn't have to be, ultra, he doesn't have to be an ultra technocrat. So I, I wouldn't be looking for somebody who's the most techn technocratically expert person in the field, but so he, the person has to have experience and knowledge in the field. And two, uh, wise kind of, for me, incorporates concepts of, of, of temperament and maturity and and in track record also as well. Someone who, who, who can navigate the parties and the issue and uh, 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 other kind of important, relevant you know, considerations all, uh, very well. Um, so so, so uh, I guess uh, being wise, uh, I was gonna say wisdom, but it's not quite wisdom, it's not what I meant. I meant being wise kind of incorporates, I guess, in summary form, uh, uh, what Sing Chi has said. Someone who can kind of Handle themselves well with, with the yeah. two parties. Perceptiveness, um, how they carry themselves. Right? Perceptiveness, perceptiveness yeah. is, is, I think, yeah. is very key because I think is 
Vivian Stanley and I both mentioned, uh, you know, nonverbal communication is, mm. is so key in some of these some of these meetings, particularly in mediation, especially when, when the emotions are high. Yes. Uh, just just one comment, saying about your comment about emotions. I think that sometimes those emotions, if, if they're if, with a skillful mediator, those those emotions can be channeled to to to, to, to create a positive sort of result. Um, but it, it's, that's tricky, though. It's, it, I, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. So Vivian. Um, what, what are the factors you would consider in picking mediator? Yeah, I think Seng Chi and Stanley have highlighted all the critical qualities that we are looking for. Mm. But the thing is, how do we find a mediator who has those qualities if we haven't been through the whole range of mediators, right? Mm. So for us, we actually went around asking people for their experience with different mediators. And we pulled our entire litigation team to give us uh, their views on certain mediators. And then we found that, you know, the larger number picked mediator A and they cited qualities like um, patience, empathy, objectivity, willingness to work hard, even though it went beyond the normal number of hours. Uh, we were looking for an evaluative mediator. We didn't want someone who was just going to shuttle the proposals backwards and forwards. So we wanted someone who was like an ex-judge who could actually tell the other side how weak or bad their case is. And maybe if our case was bad, he would tell our clients as well. So not all mediations you want that kind of person, but that was the quality we were looking for. So for us, we really had to interview people who have gone through mediation to find out who was the best mediator because you know, it's, it's important to have all these qualities, but how do we know the mediator has these qualities unless yeah. we aren't? Yeah, Stanley Lai? I tend to take a slightly different approach. I, I prefer to look at someone that, that reminds the parties least of the judge that they'll face eventually. That's so I'm looking for someone who's facilitative, mm -hmm. experience counts. I do agree with Sing Chi that for, you know, for, for technical matters, I mean like for IP and intellectual property and, and technology disputes, I mean domain expertise you know, just mm. makes all the difference. Mm. Um, because if you get a mediator that can't, that can't switch on his own computer, you, you're, you're in a serious problem. <laughs> um, and oh no, there, there are these baseline things. But at the yes. same time, you want emollients and you want someone that will facilitate the parties into a solution. Because to me, mediation works best if the parties end up agreeing and say, well, actually, that's the best way forward. And we'll yes. close it on that basis. So something can I... Can I um, yeah, Sally, just, just a quick what? point. Um, something we haven't said so far is that you can actually have co-mediation. So you, you, if you can't find one person that has all of this, you can find two people. Uh, but of course, then the problem is, can they work together? So that, that's a whole other question. There's no um, way to know Park, that. How so, do you know that? How do you know that? You know? How, how do you know whether they can work together? Yeah, exactly. And you may find out, oh my goodness, this is a disaster. They need mediation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mediate, so, mediate the mediators. Yeah. So what I would do is actually I would ask, right? Have you mediated with this person before? Like, what is it like? Who was the lawyer? And can we talk to them, right? So, <laughs> or ask the, the, the people, ask the SMC, ask the SMC, the institution that's doing it for you. Um, Stanley Park, sorry. I just, just, it's a quick comment, I think. Uh, um, can I tell you why I wouldn't want to pick an ex-judge? Yes. It's one lines of a same license. Because I want someone who's creative. Yeah. Right? A judge is not trained by just by, by, by to be creative. He, he yeah. takes arguments from, he takes briefs from opposing counsel and kind of decides who's right and he's kind of hidebound by the law. Mm. Uh, I, I want someone who's creative. Yeah, it's going to be able to facilitate. I think is the word that Stanley Lai used. I, maybe in certain contexts, I think maybe. Stanley, you, Stanley, you may think that, but for Leiting and me and Vivian, I think we can't comment on that. <laughs> oh, sorry, you want, hey, you, want a re you want a recovering lawyer like me? <laughs> actually, actually, then it all boils down to to the big, big question. Actually, if you know what you're looking for in mediator, where do you get that information? You know. Uh, how do we as mediators tell you about how we come across? So when the Singapore International Mediation uh, Center first started up, what they had was they had us doing videos, you know, to talk about us and like, you know, but I can tell you some really good mediators would be terrible about talking about themselves because they are the ones that reach out. They are the ones that are perceptive, right? Um, so the big challenge is you may know the factors that you're looking for, but you may not actually have, you know, the way in which you can sort of assess Right? And, and as mediators, I think our big challenge is, is putting our names out there. Um, Vivian and Stanley actually have an advantage because they are litigators. 
all the other lawyers have seen them in action, so they know what they're like. And actually coming back to what you said, Sandy Park, that's also why some people might pick particular retired judges because people would have known them and how they conduct proceedings. Um, and the different retired judges have different styles and they're known for different things. So it helps to be within the same um, sort of jurisdiction, which is relatively small, we know each other. Um, but when we're talking about international mediations, when we're talking about cross-border mediations, it becomes a bit hard. Um, we've got three minutes left, and I think we've had a fantastic discussion. Um, I wish we could do more and, and maybe have a part two. Uh, but thank you all very, very much. This was a fantastic discussion. I'm sorry to uh, people who put questions in the Q&A that we could not answer. Um, if you want to, I think there was one question. If you want to reach out to me, look for me online, I can try and help you a little bit. Uh, but I think, uh, Victor, uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much, Lei Ting. And I said at the beginning, this was going to be an energetic panel and you have not disappointed. So many thanks to Vivian, Sing Chi, Stanley Park, Stanley Lai, and of course yourself, Lei Ting, for orchestrating it so well. I mean, one of the reasons that the Legal Services Interest Group wanted to have this webinar as a kind of prelude to the Singapore Convention Week um, which is an opportunity uh, for business people as well as um, your colleagues in the legal fraternity to meet a broad cross-section of people from all over the place, all across the world, to learn about the latest trends in dispute resolution. And that runs from the 6th to the 10th of September. And uh, if you're interested, uh, you can log on to singaporeconventionweek.sg for the full program and also how to register. So all that remains for me to do on behalf of SICC is to thank Alan and Gledhill again for um, pulling this wonderful panel together. It's been really good fun. Um, and uh, also just to say to our members that if we can help you in any way at the chamber, drop us a line to here to help at sicc.com.sg. If you've got some topics or themes uh, or areas that you want the chamber to cover uh, in its events uh, and indeed in its interest groups, don't hesitate to let us know. So from all of us at SICC, goodbye for now. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.